Uh, good evening to all. Uh, as you know, today is a really special night because we are going to present the Seligman Crystal to both uh, Richard Heimers and Doug McGill. So for me, it's a great pleasure, it's an honor. I was the president at the time when this was decided, but uh, for well-known reasons, uh, it has not been possible to do it until now. And we will do it in this online version, but it will be anyway uh, really a nice opportunity. So what I'm going to do is uh, first to read the, uh, an, an abstract of the cita citation that was prepared by the awards committee uh, related to both awards. We will start with Richard and then follow with, uh, with Docs. Uh, and then we will present the, the awards. Uh, Magnus, our secretary general, will present the award to, uh, to both of them, the crystal itself. Um, okay, so uh, regarding Richard Heimers, uh, Richard has advanced the field of glaciology on a huge number of different fronts and to enormous effect through his insight in the technical and mathematical field of ice sheet modeling. The distinctive common feature of these advances is uh, Richard's imaginative deployment of methods and techniques from the wider realms of physics numerical methods and mathematics, leading to great advances in our understanding of glaciers and ice sheets. Of such ice bodies, he has studied their flow, their dynamical instability, their thermomechanical behavior, and the roles they play in the global system of planet Earth. Few scientists in any geophysical field will have pioneered so many wide-ranging numerical and mathematical techniques to address so many important problems. Put simply, Richard is recognized internationally as an ICID modeler of the highest caliber. Over the years, he has delivered an up panoply of thought-provoking and inspirational talks, often introducing methods, models, and concepts completely new to glaciology. More than anything, Richard has passed the idea that glaciological models benefit enormously from the direct confrontation with observational data, and that modelers and observational scientists similarly benefit from close communication with, with each other. By operating to such a high standard at this interface between modeling and observations, Richard has published many of the breakthrough papers that have led the entire field of glaciology forwards into the modern era of realistic ice models that productively exploit data from satellites and broad-scale field campaigns. In view of each of these, but above all his groundbreaking and inspirational science, the Council of the International Glaciological Society, on recommendation by the IGS Awards Committee, has decided to award the Seligman Crystal to Richard uh, Heimers. So, uh, Magnus, please, you can Hand yes, uh, well, this is a very special moment. It's not often I get to hold on to uh, hold on to this, but I can tell you that this is uh, a very nerve wracking uh, exercise because you're, uh, you're dead scared that you are going to drop it and it's going to break. So, uh, Richard, thoroughly deserved. And so I'm going to pass this over cyberspace to you and congratulations. There you go. There you go. Thank you. It's very beautiful. And uh, you've even managed to spell my name correctly. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. You are very welcome. And like I said, much deserved. Yes, thank you. Okay, then we can, are you saying something, Richard, or just some words or something? Oh, um, no, I, I've said thank you, and then I'll, I'll, I'll talk again in a few minutes. So okay, perfect. Pass on okay. to Doug. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, for me, in fact, it's a great pleasure to, to be able to be here uh, presenting these awards, but in, because may, maybe many of you don't know, but I started in glaciology with uh, Richard in particular. I was doing geophysics work, but more related to uh, gravity and uh, some seismology. And I started glaciology working with, uh, with Richard and it was really a, a great pleasure. I think mean, he was a perfect uh, master for this. And also I have a very special relationship with Doc because he was the uh, president of the IES before my, my turn. So he was my mentor for, uh, for this. So I'm really, uh, I'm really happy to be here and to be able to say these words or read uh, these citations uh, for them. Okay, then I'm going to pass to, the, to read the citation for Doc McKay. Uh, Doc's career has spanned an epic transformation of the science of glaciology and his research path. In particular, his contributions to computational glaciology has paced its evolution. Doug was an early leader scientifically, again and again finding new treasures where few had looked before, on extreme geometry changes to the Lorraine tide ice sheet, on the tidally driven details of iceberg drift, on transoceanic sound propagation of iceberg scuffing, on snow drift within ice shelf rifts, on tsunami induced calving and auto calving due to iceberg toppling. Doc's leadership has also embraced service to the community. He was the chief editor of the Journal of Glaciology and has served in an editorial capacity for the Annals of Glaciology several times. He led the IGS as president of the society from 2011 to 2017. One of Doc's greatest contributions has been his mentorship of early and mid-career scientists. Several tributes to his mentorship exemplify this. Doc publication Lessons in ICID Modeling, a mighty and freely available 428-page manuscript, exemplifies this dedication to mentoring, a publication that was influential for a whole generation of scientists interested in the matter. Doc is a geophysicist and mathematical modeler who approaches every new question like an expedition into the wild. In Doc's worldview, new code or any new idea is more like an expedition into uncharted territory. Even if the maths is deterministic, the process isn't. It's in the attention paid to both the whole and the part. It's in the focus on what didn't go as expected that the insight and the learning come. He cares about the journey and about who he's traveling with along the way. He cares who his students and collaborators are as thinking individuals, supporting them to follow their own ideas, not his. In view of each of these, but once again, above all by his groundbreaking and inspirational science, the Council of the International Glaciological Society, on recommendation by the IGS Awards Committee, has decided to award the Seligman Crystal to uh, Doc McHale, so again, uh, um, Magnus, you can proceed to present the, the crystal. Thank you. You have to bear with, my, with me on this one. Uh, it's much further going up to Chicago than simply down into Cambridge. So we have to fly quite a bit higher. Uh, the crystal has, I'm not going to. And, uh, but it's really cold up there. So I don't know what's going to happen, but bear with me. And it's got, it's a delicate operation. Hang on. Okay, we're going to have it clean. Okay, brother. Congratulations, and well deserved. Yeah. <laughs> You mute. <laughs> Thank you. I, I needed to unmute. It's very cold from its trip, and it has a beautiful hexagonal structure. I'm just very impressed with it. And I say thank you to the community for the recognition, and especially thank you to all the people who have reviewed my manuscripts 
and all the people who have tolerated all the incredible stupid mistakes that I've made and all the times that I've dragged people down blind alleys. But thank you very much for this wonderful recognition. I think that uh, we move on to the uh, talks and um, I'm the first person to be up and uh, Richard is going to be second. So should I begin now? I think so. Yes, of course, the floor is yours. I will share my screen and start my slide presentation. Uh, I want to warn everybody that my view of who was Gerald Seligman is very personal. It's based on the fact that my great grandfather was a genealogist. So I'm very interested in telling you about who Gerald Seligman was, not so much as a scholar or a scientist, but as a person who fit within his community. The first thing I learned about Gerald Seligman is that there are very few pictures of him. Um, here is uh, a picture of him on the Jungfrau Jock. Uh, doing his um, science in the late 1930s. Here is a picture of him receiving the first Seligman crystal. And I think Hilda Richardson was the secretary general at that time. And I do think she penciled in the irises of his eyes, making him look slightly like a zombie because uh, the camera sort of washed out uh, his photograph there. This I, photograph I got yesterday from Magnus, and it's the best photograph I have and the only one I've been able to find in color. Uh, and that's Gerald Seligman uh, at his house, uh, standing with his wife, who I believe her name was Molly. But even though there may be a few, Laurie, only a few pictures, excuse me? It's Lori. Lori, thank you. Even though there may be only a few pictures of Gerald Seligman, there may very well be sculptures of him. And I've spoken with two of the family members of Gerald Seligman. The, the first is Thomas Seligman, who's the director of the Cantor Museum of Art at Stanford University, very prestigious art historian. He's the first cousin once removed of Gerald Seligman. And he absolutely is adamant that Gerald Seligman, when he was in his early 20s, was a model who posed for Auguste Rodin, the famous sculpture. And uh, Thomas Seligman should know this uh, because the largest uh, uh, gallery of Rodin sculptures is at Stanford University in his museum. Uh, I did talk to uh, Seligman's uh, grand nephew, who is also an artist in London, and he said it is plausible that Seligman was indeed a model for, for Rodin, but he could not confirm it. So this means that in addition to a sparse number of photos, you may actually be able to go see Seligman in a sculpture garden, but I'm going to warn you that all of Rodin's sculptures show human beings in an unclothed state, so be prepared. You may see more of Seligman than you uh, bargained for. Well, this is how I see his life. He was born in 1886 and he died in 1973 uh, with the Seligman crystal going on from 1963. And I've always sort of wondered, you know, is Gerald Seligman sort of forgotten? You know, do people really know anything about him? So what I'm going to do is tell you a brief story of his life but I'm gonna organize it in four parts. First part is the Gilded Age, the age that he was born into. The second part is the story of Gerald Seligman as an industrialist, who he was not a scientist. Uh, the third is his age as an amateur scientist when he uh, co-founded the IGS and the Journal of Glaciology. And then finally, the fourth part is everything in the modern world after Seligman died, you know, what do we know about him? What, what is his legacy? So we go into the first part and 
Seligman was born into an extraordinary family, extraordinary for being incredibly successful and rich. Um, so I want you to think Downton Abbey here. Um, Seligman's father, Isaac Seligman, uh, was born uh, to an extremely um, uh, 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 notable Jewish family in Beiersdorf, Germany. But Isaac and his seven brothers emigrated to both the UK and to North America, and they created one of the greatest venture capitalist organizations of the Gilded Age, out of London and out of Boston. Seligman himself was born in Lincoln House in Clapham uh, from Isaac Seligman. And I show the picture photograph of the servants who were serving in Seligman's house uh, about five years before he was born in 1886. Uh, the Seligman family uh, was so successful that they built railroads throughout the United States. And one of uh, the consequences of that is Seligman, Arizona, a town is named after the Seligman family. The Seligman uh, uh, venture capital organization also provided the major source of funding for the Panama Canal that actually got built. But in addition to being ex uh, you know, extremely wealthy, uh, they had great tastes in homes. Um, Gerald Seligman's father eventually moved to 17 Kensington Place Gardens uh, in London. And I looked it up and today it was, it's listed for $135 million and it's owned by Russian Israeli billionaire Roman Abramovich. So this was a true Gilded Age, Gilded Age family. Uh, you might ask, well, did Seligman himself also have uh, a giant mansion or a beautiful house? And uh, my research led me to Hans Weertman's uh, photography collection, uh, thanks to uh, Bruce Weertman. And this is a photograph of Seligman, uh, George, uh, Gerald Seligman's house in 1959. It it's called Little Dane. The house has a name, and it's in Biddenden, uh, Kent. And uh, from this slide, I was able to find the listing in the real estate uh, for this house now. And it's worth, uh, it's, on the, it's on the market now for 2,950,000 pounds. So I know Tavi Murray's having trouble with her kitchen. And I just wanted to say, here's a, a place you might consider, you know, if you want to move out of your house. And of course, in the lower right, I have a picture of Gerald Seligman. Uh, and his wife standing uh, somewhere around the grounds of this beautiful house. But most importantly, the Seligman family was a family of integrity and principle and believed in inclusion and social justice. And Mo, uh, his father was a very famous philanthropist who spent um, much energy working on um, the um, problems of anti-Semitism in Europe, uh, supporting organizations that uh, either provided relief or um, fought against uh, the, the anti-Semitic movements uh, throughout Europe uh, during the uh, early part of the 20th century. Uh, and I've shown one uh, of the um, philanthropic uh, the organizations that uh, Isaac Seligman, uh, Gerald's father, supported. It was the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies uh, in the United King Kingdom. Uh, Isaac Seligman underwrote uh, this organization, and uh, it, thus it means that Gerald Seligman, even though he was born incredibly rich into a rich Gilded Age family, what was most important to him and it was most driven to him and taught to him by his family was the necessity of being uh, principled and liberal and uh, uh, just uh, in life, despite the wealth that you might have. Okay, now we move on to the next phase. Uh, see, uh, this is Seligman as an industrialist and 
I'll show another television program uh, here about an industrialist at the same time. And this would be Mr. Selfridge uh, in London. So it was ab about the same time. So there's two things to realize here. First, uh, Gerald was the co-founder of the APV company. Uh, that stands for Aluminum Piece and Vessel Company. And that company uh, he was founded with his brother, uh, Richard Seligman, who I'll also point a few things out about. But at the same time, uh, Gerald became an incredibly avid skier, and he became the president of the Ski Club of Great Britain, as well as the editor of the Journal of the Ski Club, that was called Ski Notes. So this is the first time that uh, Seligman became interested in ice and glaciology and when he became uh, sort of trained as, a, uh, as an editor. This is uh, Gerald's brother, Richard Seligman, uh, who is also a CBE like uh, Tavi Murray. He did get a PhD, uh, Gerald did not have a PhD. Um, to this day, the Seligman lecture of the um, Society for Chemical uh, Industries is uh, uh, named after him. He was the president of the Institute of Metals and they had the first patent for plate heat exchangers and the father of two of Adrian, his son and grandfather of Matthew, who I will talk about later. But basically what this company did is it brewed beer, it made equipment for brewing beer, homogenizing milk, making vegetable oil and pharmaceuticals. So even though Gerald was born to a very wealthy family, he himself with his brother formed a corporation that added to the wealth. And that company is still uh, in existence today as APV, which is owned as a subsidiary of SPX Flow. And it's uh, a publicly held company and you can buy stock in it. But Seligman also was the, uh, interested in the Ski Club of Great Britain, which is also in existence today. And in fact, he was the president from 1927 to 1929. But just before he was president, he served as the vice president under Hugh Dowding. Hugh Dowding uh, was the, um, the air marshal of the RAF fighter squadron during the Battle of Britain. And I hope Hester Giscoot will check my uh, English here. He is one of the few to whom so much was owed by so many. I hope there were no dangling participles there. But at the ski club, uh, Gerald also met Noel O'Dell, who was a famous mountaineer and a scientist who on the Everest expedition with uh, George Mallory was the last person to see Mallory and Irvine advancing towards the summit. And Noel O'Dell was also recruited by Gerald to be a, a member of the first council of the IGS. Now we get to the third stage uh, when Gerald decided he was going to retire at about age 45 and become an amateur scientist. And for a television view of it, I think of him as being much like David Attenborough, uh, someone who communicates the science and supports the science, but is himself not a professional, but rather an amateur. Um, and there's a lot going on here, but the, the basic things that I wanna talk about are what he published, what he did with the Young Jock expedition and the founding of the Journal of Glaciology. Uh, first, his publications. His most famous one is his book, Snow Structure and Ski Fields, published in 1936. I did the Google search, it was cited 391 times. By the way, he was cited uh, in 2022 uh, in the cryosphere, so he has one citation in 2022. And uh, I calculated his H index to be six with a total of 570 citations. And that's pretty good for someone who only had a BA and started glaciology in, when he was 45. But I will point out that he did receive a honorary PhD uh, in 1963 from the University of Innsbruck. He, his most sort of daring work in glaciology was his expedition in the mid to late 1930s on the Jungfraujoch. 
And on that expedition, he uh, wanted to de develop the idea of how snow turns into ice to become a, gla a glacier. And for, to do that, he found the two best crystallographers uh, in the world. Uh, one was Max Perutz, and the other was J.D. Bernal, both at the Cavendish Lab of uh, University of Cambridge. And just like, you know, just in the main um, personality of Seligman, uh, the, the paper about the crystallography was not written by Perutz and Bernal, even though they did the work because World War I had started and Perutz uh, being an, uh, what is called an enemy alien had been shipped to Canada and Bernal was working on other things. So Seligman decided that he would write up the results on their behalf. And there's a funny story, interesting story about Perutz and Bernal. First of all, Bernal is the uh, PhD advisor of Perutz and also the postdoc advisor of Rosalind Franklin. And this is a very interesting story in science. Uh, you see over on the uh, right, uh, Max Perutz on the Jungfrau Yacht doing his crystallography. But Perutz became an extremely eminent scientist. Uh, later in, in the 50s, he was racing Linus Pauling at Caltech to figure out the, the structure of biomolecules, including DNA. Uh, incidentally, Pauling's was the father-in-law of Barclay Cam, another um, Seligman crystal winner. Uh, Perutz won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1962. He was also the advisor of John Glenn, the man of Glenn's flow law. He was the advisor of Francis Crick and James Watson, and the uh, finder of Photo 51 that Rosalind Fra Franklin uh, produced. So um, kind of a web of information here connects uh, Gerald Seligman to one of the greatest elements of science, but also one of the most unjust elements of science. Because when in 1962, uh, Perutz's student Francis Crick and his PhD postdoc, James Watson, got the Nobel Prize for medicine, but Rosalind Franklin, who had actually developed the idea first was completely forgotten. And uh, this would not have gone down well with Ger Gerald if he uh, was aware of it. Okay, he uh, formed the IGS. He tactically decided to call it the British Glaciological Society before the International Glaciological so Society. And this was planned because he wanted the Royal Geographical Society of England to underwrite the Journal of Glaciology and to bring status to the IGS. And so the BGS was done tactically in order to develop more stature for the IGS and to frankly to provide money for the journal before there were any subscribers, before there were any members of the British uh, Glaciological Society. He did this with um, uh, James Wordy, who incidentally was the scientist on Shackleton's endurance expedition, which um, was in the Weddell Sea where the ship sank. So yes, these are all the journals that were edited by uh, Gerald Seligman. And he did wonderful things with the journal, including developing the Google Scholar of uh, its day. Uh, for, twice a year, um, Gerald himself developed a bibliography of critical glaciological literature and would print it in the journal so that everyone would know everything that was published about glaciology. Uh, those of us who use Google Scholar to, to search for papers cannot imagine how it must have been difficult to use this kind of material in the past to find the literature uh, that you need to find. So now we get to the last part. And this is the modern part of, uh, of our world, but the part of the world after Gerald's death. And I've decided to use uh, David Bowie as my icon of this age. And uh, so I've looked at Seligman's family and I've asked, you know, what legacy does he present to us in the modern world? So I took a look at his family and I found out that his nephew, son of um, 
of his brother who formed uh, the aluminum uh, company, uh, was a famous commander during World War II and a, a commando for the um, flotilla of the Levant. And his son was Matthew Seligman. Matthew Seligman is a famous bass guitarist. So Matthew is the uh, great nephew of Gerald. Sadly, Matthew, despite being both Richard's and my age, died in 2020 of COVID-19. Turns out that Matthew was the uh, bassist for David Bowie at Live Aid, which raised 135 million pounds for famine relief, exactly the same amount of money that 17 Kensington Palace Gardens house would list for now, which was Seligman's father's house. Um, turns out Matthew was also on a band called the Soft Boys, and he replaced someone named uh, Andy Metcalf in 1979. And Andy Metcalf, it turns out, was the school friend of Richard Hindmarsh, who is the Seligman Laureate. So this means that Seligman's karma is contributed to glaciology by bringing in Richard Hindmarsh. We don't know. It's possible that had Richard Hindmarsh not met Andy Metcalf, who had not been uh, replaced by Matthew Seligman, that Richard Hindmarsh might have gone in some other direction. So I'm delighted to think that there's a cosmic cycle that connects all of us to Seligman because we have Richard Hindmarsh in our world. Another important thing, Richard Hindmarsh has a Bowie number of three. That means three degrees of separation from David Bowie. And by the way, that gives all of us on this Zoom call four degrees of separation from David Bowie. So to get serious and to wrap it up, I want to note that possibly the greatest you know, honor that Seligman had besides the Seligman crystal was he won the Victoria Medal of the Royal Geographical Society of England. And he did it on the medal's 50th anniversary of its existence. And I'll note that 2019 was roughly the 50th anniversary of the Seligman crystal when both um, Richard and I received it. Uh, and it was after the first half of the 20th century. It was uh, in 1959 when, when the Victoria Medal was awarded to Seligman. I looked it up and it turns out that there had been, Seligman was the 34th recipient of the uh, Victoria Medal, but only one of the previous recipients was a uh, female. But now it's the 21st century and I'm hoping I'm really hoping that the Victoria Medal in its second 50 or its most recent 50 years is awarding uh, merit and recognition to a more diverse community uh, that reflects the diversity of the community uh, that does uh, earth science and geographical um, studies. So I have that hope for the Victoria Medal. I hope that now it is more inclusive and just. And I think that um, Gerald Seligman would view that as being important, not only for the Victoria Medal, but for all the honors that he's received. And that's basically it. That's my story of Gerald Abraham Seligman. And I will now um, turn over my screen to uh, Richard Hindmarsh, um, and I will hope that I haven't gone over time. So Richard, you have to unmute. Thank you, Doug. Um, that was a wonderful talk. Um, I'm going to point to the backdrop on my uh, scene and say it's, it's a group of people who like working outdoors. 
and um, they're dressed very oddly, so it befits glaciologists. In fact, quite a few of them are scarecrows. And the, the central character is someone called Wurzel Gummidge, and he's won a prize. So, and uh, when, it, when he was um, very happy and surprised about something, he'd come up with a phrase that's well known to glacial geologists, and that's uh, muddy boots. So I'll, I'll share my screen now. Oh, yes. All right, yes. Um, in the first week of July, I was phoned from Stanford um, by Magnus and by Paco, and I was very surprised and very delighted and very flattered to uh, be told I was, uh, I'd been awarded the um, Seligman Crystal. So I'd say to everyone, thank you very much, and in particular to the nominators, people who are nominating, I still don't know who they are, the awards committee, uh, the IGS council, and uh, the staff of the IGS as well. Now, um, I'm going to say thank you very, thank you to many, many others. And I was thinking about that. And then obviously the first was my parents, my family. So this is a photo of my mother. Uh, and she's, I've got a silky, oh, sorry, I've got a sulky, confused face. And um, it's because my mind to uh, mysterious materials that both transmit and reflect electromagnetic waves. And um, I still got sulky and confused face when I think about that. And um, my mother has got something in common, two items on her CV in common with the former Prime Minister of Great Britain, um, Theresa May. And that's that um, she's the daughter of a vicar and uh, she got a degree in geography from the oldest university in the country. Other character is my father, Roland. He's the bearded explorer at the back and he's, he's set me on a task where I look far more cheerful and it's, uh, it's a far more, far more simple task. Now, um, I may have missed, oh yeah, Roland got a degree in English and philosophy from the second oldest university in the country, which is, um, I may have led you about the university that Lina went to. It wasn't, it wasn't, the country wasn't England and it wasn't uh, Scotland or Ireland either. In fact, it was Sweden and it was the, uh, the oldest university is Uppsala University. Um, now, um, this guy here has got a happy, cheerful look on his face because the task is simple. And this guy here, it's me later on, has got a, a sort of acquiring look because uh, all my um, family, well, my sisters and my mother are laughing at something that Mark has said, my little brother. Mark. And so I just, how, how, how someone ridiculously younger than myself can someone come up with something that's both ridiculously clever and ridiculously funny. Now, when she was at Uppsala, uh, Lena, um, well, there's, there's a sort of certain mystery in that um, her father forbade her from studying science, but she managed to uh, convince him that uh, a geography department was acceptable. And when she was at this geography department, students, graduate students were raving about um, a new form of um, geochronology that emerged at a rival institute 60 kilometers to the south. And this was uh, by characters called, uh, well, in Sweden, de Yer, in Britain, de Geer, and in um, Belgium, de Geer. And this was the Vav chronology. And well, Lena wasn't very convinced because she couldn't see the patterns that the graduate students were talking about. Um, now, there, there is another aspect, which is one I'm most associated with, and uh, it's modeling. So uh, Felix um, and his quantitative methods 101 uh, puts that uh, an image like the one I've shown up on the, up on the screen. And then he asks the, um, the students, the 18 year olds, basically, what do you think it is? And then they say, oh, it's a cat. And then he says, no, no, a mouse, no, no, a seal, no, no. 
And I, you know, they go on for a while and then he says, he emphasizes, no, it's not a cat, it's a model of a cat. And from that he emphasizes well, that um, there is a difference between model and reality. So the talk is what we have done. And I'm going to explore what we mean by we. Um, so the, the, I've sort of basically covered the, uh, uh, the range of glaciology from uh, geochronology and the Diers and uh, modeling and Felix and various others. Um, now, um, well, about 10 years ago, I was lucky enough to become associated with uh, Advanced Climate Dynamics course. And um, it's, a, it's a group of climate scientists basically do everything from uh, um, I've seen glaciations to volcanic uh, eruptions and hurricanes. And there was a 10th anniversary in a small town called Otta. It's in the middle of Norway, um, bet halfway between Oslo and Trondheim. And at Otta Station, there's this statue here. And it's of um, someone called um, Guri, who's playing the Prilla horn. And um, what she, she, the reason why they put a statue is that um, 400 years ago, there was an army of people, um, well, soldiers basically, uh, marching across Norway from, um, to come to the aid of the Swedes. So she went up uh, 600 meters up onto the hills around there and kept an eye open for them. And when the eye, when she spotted them, she um, played the Prilla horn. And then the people down there, as a sign, signaled to the people and uh, they managed to stop the army. So there is an essence in that of uh, adoption that uh, Prilaguri um, adopted the um, people of Otta, and then 200 years later they adopted her. And it's this sense of mutual adoption in the uh, glacial community that I want to explore a bit further. So um, there's quite a few other people at Bass um, who are um, uh, associated with me. So there's people who are on my interviewing panel. That's Chris Doak, who sadly died about a year ago, and Liz Morris. And um, well, yeah, it shows Chris in his typical pose of uh, getting his, his head down, getting to work, and Liz is kind of more outward looking. Then there's, um, there's about half the people I sat on the interview panels for. Um, all the people on this page speak very good English, but uh, Gisela uh, speaks German, Fabian speaks French, Carlos speaks Spanish, and Gwendolyn, well, she doesn't speak Welsh, she speaks Swiss German. And there's um, my contemporaries, director of science at Bass, Ed King, who uh, helped me, or I helped him build the Dolores radar. And there's Robert Mulvaney, a core driller, who's showing off some ice that he drilled to uh, a journalist. So he participates in outreach as well. And there's Paco and Magnus. Paco spent uh, three months at Bass in 2001. And Magnus moved the IGS office uh, with Louise uh, to Bass maybe five or six years ago. Now, um, I did my PhD at Durham. They like to call it Dunelm. And... Um, that's the geography department there in which I did the PhD. And there's lots of notable characters there, but two of them were um, my supervisor. And he's well, he was very conscientious and very well read. So at the end of every supervision session, he'd uh, hand me a list of three or four papers, which he thought said, you really need to read those, Richard. And then Jasbir, um, well, he encouraged me to take myself less seriously and take my work more seriously. And he, he retired as head of IT at Birkbeck College and the University of London a few years ago. Now that snazzy cylindrical thing wasn't there um, when I got, was a postgrad at Durham. So this is a photo which uh, indicates what it was like. It was taken about 10 years before um, I, I was there. A third of the units were in these places called the huts. And we were called the Hutters, and that was uh, a couple of years before the emergence of Columban. Um, who, um, and 
well, look, if you have a can have a close look at this, it looks like they're one story buildings, but in the, in our hut, there was a cellar and I practiced a musical instrument. And I'll give you a hint as to what the musical instrument was. So there was two, two of my inspirations were um, uh, a South African called Dudu Bukwana. And uh, well, he saw his, the government telling him who he could and couldn't play with. The other was Junior Walker, who's um, silky, energetic saxophone inspired me in my in the early 60s. And um, well, I guess they also inspired uh, Lisa Simpson. Now, um, Junior Walker, his best known tune is uh, Roadrunner. So that's a segue into my next slide. And it's, uh, it's about a roadrunner called um, Henry Rono. And in 19, Northern Hemisphere spring of 1978, he uh, broke four world records at, um, well, serious distances, 10 kilometers, five kilometers, uh, 3,000 meters steeplechase and 3,000 meters flat. So we were delighted in September of um, 2000, 1978 that he was going to appear in a, uh, a stadium in Newcastle. And uh, well, we, we were sort of worried because we didn't realize or we thought that 1500 meters wasn't a, a distance where he was going to break a world record, but maybe last severe and was going to pop over from Helsinki. But we were disappointed because uh, when it came to the start, um, Henry was there with um, just two young Brits. And then after two, after the, one of the young Brits tore off ahead very fast. And we thought, well, he's a pacemaker, but he's, uh, he's obviously running too fast. And, but after two laps, 800 meters, he was kind of 30 or 40 meters ahead. And Henry did manage to catch up with this young Brit, um, but he was five meters behind at the um, finishing line. And so I'm gonna show a photo of the young Brit six years later when he won a gold in the uh, eight, uh, 1500 meters in LA. And of course it's uh, Sebastian Coe. So I, I was present at the, uh, well, probably the first race, or maybe even the only race between uh, Sebastian Coe and uh, Henry Rono. Now, I boasted about this to my mum and dad, and they revealed that uh, a few months after they got married, they were living in a small town in, sorry, a medium-sized city in Sweden. Um, and they'd gone to an Indian music concert and seen a man who was later to become very famous as a sitar player. And that the year was 1950, so it's not George. Uh, not George Harrison, it's, um, it's the, the coming to fame of Ravi Shankar. Now, I, I kind of um, thought about that. And then um, eventually, um, someone who was a roadie of Katrina and the Waves got me to go and see a concert of theirs uh, two years before their number one hit. I'm sorry, not, not their big hit, Walking on Sunshine. So I should say something about this, that they, um, well, they filmed it, but the, the film crew could only, they could only afford the film crew for one day. So it was a, a foggy day as it happened. So they didn't have any sunshine. And the other thing is that um, the waves uh, are all dressed in the same outfits, more or less, gray coat jeans. The only distinguishing features are the, the color of the trainers. And um, of course, Katrina, said well that's not a problem because they've got clearly defined and distinct roles so that's the drummer that's the bassist and uh, that's the um lead guitarist in fact he, he's kimberly rue who uh, almost certainly knew matthew seligman and probably knew andy metcalf as well and katrina played the rhythm guitar uh, on half the numbers and uh, my friend the roadie said that katrina probably was inspired by the roadie to um put on that art student punk outfit. Now, get back to geophysics. This is uh, a woodblock um, printer called Hoxai. He was born Halloween day, uh, 1760. And my guess is that uh, these are a bunch of his grad students and um, they're wondering, you know, Hoxai had promised them a treat, but maybe, maybe it was turning into a trick. Um, so there's, there's some examples here of uh, 
dynamic geophysics. There's huge wave breaking, and then there's Mount Fuji in the background, which uh, might or might not be just about to erupt. So that brings us back to drumlins. So this is a, a drumlin, and then there's been considerable um, controversy about how fast they're formed. It ranges from uh, a few hours from the flood outburst people to uh, best part of a millennium from, because you know glaciers move really slowly. So to examine this, um, Chris Clark, Chris Stokes, uh, Andrew Fowler, Heike Kramberg, um, Matteo Spaniolo and Paul Dunlop uh, got funded to do a project. Um, Matteo and Paula, uh, there, there were two field trips and Matteo and Paul were only on one. Um, and then Chris, Chris Clark organized it. We, we, we um, looked for zillions of drumlins and they were both in the northeast of England, very northeast, and the southeast of Scotland, which explains that. And then Chris, um, one lunch, Chris sat us down with our sandwiches by a drumlin. And there was a river in between and he asked us to uh, riff on the, uh, the role that rivers might have played in drumlin formation. And uh, that led to various work by uh, Andrew Fowler and Mike Chapuania, for example. Now, the other example, the other field trip is actually in Chris's backyard that he got us to build a drumlin, or he got us and his tractor, Big Red, to build a drumlin. This was a scale model of the mean um, drumlin size. So um, contracted a hundredfold in the horizontal dimension and tenfold in the vertical dimension. It was based on work done by Chris's students, Anna Hughes and Sarah Greenwood, who mapped all the drum, drumlins in uh, Great Britain and Ireland and found, well, 60,000 altogether. Now, this is obviously an analog model of a drumlin because it only took us a few hours to build. And that raises the question, uh, how are real drumlins formed? And a clue uh, is uh, provided by the reappearance of Felix's cat uh, cat model and the fact that I've circled hiking Andrew's uh, heads, that there's going to be some mathematics involved. So, um, well, the, so one mathematical jargon word for shape formation is morphogenesis. And I say that because there was a, a paper written by um, Alan Turing in the early 1950s. Um, and he, um, well, I've, I've sampled from the abstract. A system originally quite homogeneous may later develop a pattern due to an instability. And this instability refers to a small um, disturbance grows and grows and grows. Um, the theory does not make any new hypotheses. Well-known physical laws are sufficient to account for the facts. So hang on, has uh, Turing come up with a chemical theory of drumlin formation? The answer is no. It's a mathematical model of uh, growing embryo. And it's a simplification. But um, and then the, the cat model comes and uh, indicates that mathematics is going to be involved. So. Um, Yep, there are patterns in nature. There's patterns in the sky, and there's patterns on the rivers caused by flowing water. And there's also patterns um, in the um, pat patterns um, underneath the ice. So this is um, uh, a photo from a paper by Paul Dunlop and Chris Clark. Uh, Chris Clark supervised Paul Dunlop's. Um, a PhD thesis, and Paul looked at around 25,000 ribbed moraines in uh, Canada, Finland, and Ireland, and he measured the distance between the ridge crests. And they were most of them lay between 300 meters and 1,000 meters. I was also a supervisor, and the reason was that I'd come up with a theory a few years before, which explained um, the observations or ex explained the instability. And Paul's observations didn't falsify my theory in any way. So it involved a, a combination of likely parameters, the base of shear stress, the, sp the speed, and the water pressure. And um, it, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, what, what it does use is a viscous law of till deformation. But um, I've been saying for at least 25 years that that represents an aggregation or a parameterization in space and time 
of many plastic events. So it's not that there isn't this binary distinction between viscous and plastic theories. So um, and theory was uh, successful in explaining rib moraine geometry. Um, so we got together and wrote a paper at uh, Paul Shivorn and Molly's house in uh, Buncrana. So in the morning and the evening, we'd talk with each other or tap away at our own computers to uh, answer questions. And uh, that's where Buncrana is in the very northern half of Ireland. And then the team, uh, Paul came up with the acronym BREE for bed ribbing instability explanations. So uh, this is a good example of teamwork, how we all adopted each other. The uh, story doesn't stop there. That's Olga Sergienko, who's got her uh, anti-skewer armor on. And she was a student of um, Doug's. And uh, the cat the cat model would say that there's uh, some modeling coming up. And indeed, there is. So um, Olga took Doug's equations, added some further terms, uh, and, uh, enthusiastically endorsed by George Stokes. And she, um, the Princeton Tiger isn't simply to celebrate the Chinese New Year of yesterday, but also to show that the, 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 these are tiger stripes uh, in the basal shear stress. And I got my name in the paper because I adopted the theory I'd used with Paul and Chris, uh, adopted it by adding pressure gradients due to flowing water and showed that it could also predict these stripes. And then uh, Chris Stokes, he's not a relative of George Stokes. Um, he uh, came up with some observations oops, of um, in the Buffalo ice stream in Saskatchewan of features that uh, were similarly spaced to the um, Thwaites tiger stripes. So that shows that uh, by all pulling together, you can come up with something new. So that's the Drumlin uh, in Chris's yard. And there's a a bunch of soft rockers, Chris Stokes, Matteo, Chris Clark, and mathematicians, Heike and Andrew. Um, and then you might notice that uh, steep slope at the back. And then Chris Clark um, encourages people to run it up, run up it, and he times them. And the, the fastest time last time I um, inquired was by Stephen Livingston, who's a, a lecturer at uh, uh, Sheffield in uh, glacial geomorphology. Now, it's the fastest time recorded by Chris, but is it the fastest time ever? Because there's uh, one bit of information I haven't told you is that the aunt of a world-class British athlete lives just over the hill. And the, the, the fact that the athlete is world-class is because they won uh, a gold medal in multiple events at the on Super Saturday in the London Olympics. So it's... Um, there's three people who did that. So it's not Greg Rutherford because he only won a gold in the long jump. It's not Mo Salah. He won golds in five, five, five k and ten k. But he's a Somali refugee, so it would be a sort of bizarre series of events that um, uh, caused an aunt of his to live in these hills. And of course, it's uh, Jessica Jessica Ennis. Now she's very articulate, intelligent. But she's also got a competitive streak because she, otherwise she wouldn't have got a um, gold medal. So I'm wondering, is she also aiming for the Seligman crystal? And the, the reason I say that is that uh, on her jersey, she's got all kinds of numbers. So is she going to say that one or more of them are the index in the, uh, the Glenn's law? And uh, for the Seligman crystal, will the headline say Seligman crystal? Ennis tells us what N is. Now, one person who's very interested in what N is, is uh, Charlie Raymond. Uh, he, he was also uh, born on Halloween, uh, like Hokusai. Um, and I was at his 80th birthday party two or three years ago. And his grad, grad students uh, all told stories about um, marches, well, not walks across the uh, mountains in Northwest um, America which they uh, feared were going to be tricks, but uh, at the end, they turned out to be real treats. So um, now I must point out that uh, oh, the Raymond effect is due 
to ice being shear thinning. And I'll tell you what the Raymond effect is in a moment. And I must point out that, uh, in fact, the, the Glenn's law is um, unlikely to be as simple as uh, Glenn proposed it um, 50 or 60 years ago. And there may be more than one term. And then Erin Pettit and Ed Waddington have most recently suggested one of these, in one of these terms, n is 1. And the same arguments have been put forward by uh, Eric Wolf and Chris Doak and also Leslie Morland and George Smith. And the reason why that's the problem is that uh, using the shallow ice approximation, the shear stress goes to zero, so maybe nothing should be happening. So Charlie realized that and he, um, well, this, this is a, an image of a divide. It's actually the Seipel Dome and the elevation is by GPS and the, rec the bed is um, determined by radar and the um, there's actually layers within the um, ice which are former surfaces which have been buried by subsequent snowfall and uh, distorted by glacier flow and Charlie did finite element modeling and Charlie was a finite element pioneer uh, and showed that there was layers of higher viscosity uh, at the base of the divide and that's what the Raymond effect is and the Raymond effect because of this that this higher viscosity um, the, the anticlines form just above the um, just beneath the divide now the um, now lots of people um, involved in the Seipel dome but uh, at the forefront was Nadine Nerison and um, she did quite a bit of the radar surveying and I may have misremembered this in remembered this incorrectly, but um, the radar as developed then uh, had to run at half the stall speed of a skidoo to pick up the, um, the radar layers. So they had to be, they had to go over exactly the same route twice. And if there'd been a storm in between, then all the tracks had been lost. Um, now Charlie's work hadn't go unnoticed by other people. So this is a, a radar gram for high frequency radar um, team led by David Vaughan and it only went the higher frequency only goes down to 100 meters but uh, Ed Waddington was co-author on both of these papers. Now there is a, a consequence of this which is that um, the Raymond effect alters the strain rates so if this area is of higher viscosity it's got to squidge down ice has to be compressing a bit faster uh, in that region and, uh, in the mid-90s, when these measurements were taken, um, you weren't able to directly measure strain rates uh, under the, uh, under, in ice, within ice sheets. But um, subsequently, and it was due to developments by Chris Doak and Keith Nichols, uh, it, it um, became possible with what's known as the phase-sensitive radar, the PRES. And um, while well, the measurement time is even slower than Nadine's, that um, you had to go to a point and stay there uh, for at least 20 minutes and then go on to the next point. So the, in effect, the measuring time was 40 minutes or greater than equal to 40 minutes. And um, Tali went to Fletcher and I'll no notice the C, that stands for the, the center of the cupola. And notice this blue line, which extends along the divide ridge there and into a trough there. And there's, there's another thing about the Fletcher is that three divides uh, meet there. So it's a triple junction. So but the, what the Raymond effect was occurring there, because I'd um, been there a few years earlier and uh, sounded the layers. And then Tolly's results, uh, these are in a paper uh, lead authored by Johnny Kingslake, um, that the um, well, what I'm going to show is that um, you fit the, line, fit the line through the upper part of the um, velocity. Sorry, these are the velocity measurements here, the, the red dots. And you fit a line through the, um, through the red dots in the upper uh, part and get the strain rate. And this is a plot of the strain rates. Um, and um, well, the, ver the vertical strain rate is negative. So where it's lower, it's squishing down faster. And so this is direct evidence of the Raymond effect occurring. And then Tolly was uh, very happy to go. 
partly not least because uh, Fabian had, had uh, Fabian Gier had uh, obtained good results a couple of years before in, from Greenland and um, did some modeling as well. From this, we deduced that uh, N was about 4.5, which was uh, the same as a, a number that Hans Wittmann came up with. So the Raymond effect can also be used to dating, dating ice disturbances. And um, I'll show the picture up. I emphasize that Roosevelt's Islands in West Antarctica, in case there's anyone from the Big Apple who thinks it's in the East River. Um, these are the Conway brothers, both of whom I went to Roosevelt Island with. Howard's the younger one, and he's been uh, Antarctica a couple of dozen times. And Morris is the older one. He's been 30 times. So that's, uh, well, it's, a mild, it's an iron rule of glaciological brothers that um, the elder one should go six times more than the younger ones. It's certainly true for the Hindmarsh brothers. But it's not true probably for the Hubbard brothers, but they were, um, Alan was always a bit of a rebel. Now, um, at Roosevelt Island, uh, Howard Conway and I think probably Ben Smith took these radargrams. Then they realized they weren't big enough. So they realized that they hadn't reached completion. They hadn't um, grown any bigger because they were formed too recently, that they started forming too recently. The divide um, only moved there. And they combined that with uh, work on the Transantarctic trans Mountains done by Brenda Hall, who um, um, looked at the geology all along and they came up with the swing gate model. That's a direction for um, Nancy Butler uh, of the Victoria University of Wellington to uh, mount a drilling project. It was a drilling project which included six different countries. So this is, I, I was there at, before the drilling started and after the drilling finished with the PRES. And uh, this is a, 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 one of the drilling years. And there's Nancy there and there's, there's drill engineer, Darcy. Um, and um, well, the, the results are still coming out, but um, this paper here was with 70 co-authors. And uh, there were two or three quantitative teams and uh, they came up with all kinds of different numbers, but um, so that, that merits the reappearance of the, the model of the cat. Now, recently plumes have been discovered underneath um, Antarctica and Greenland ice sheets. This, this feature here is the plume, and there's three possible explanations. It's freeze-on, which is first advocated by uh, Robin Bell and co. There's uh, migrating sticky spots. This migrating sticky spots is areas on the base which have got higher resistance. And then there's anisotropy of the ice. And, um, well, Gwendolyn uh, was firmly in, and still is firmly in favor of the freezing hypothesis. So she wrote a paper and she got together uh, a team of three ice sheet modelers and uh, that's Katrina Frett. She uh, assigned them clearly defined and distinct roles. So Carlos, for example, was the full Stokes guy. And um, well, it's a question. Um, well, the Hindmarsh contributions, were they confusing or constructive? And this, the Gwendo and team came up with the idea that these plumes could form in around a millennium or so. And then, well, that's the answer. I mean, this is modeling. The answer is that uh, you have to drill into one of these plumes at least, at the very least, and actually multiple many of these plumes and recover the ice from it to distinguish these hypotheses. Now, I'll go back to um, paleo ice sheets and um, think about um, the ice sheets that used to exist over Ireland and uh, Great Britain. And in 1976, a paper was published. I think the author was D.Q. Bowen, where the dashed line shows that the margins are well, just about there. And then uh, 2010, Chris Clark, Anna Hughes, Sarah Greenwood, Colm Jordan, and Hans Peter Sierup came up with these lines here, which considerably extended. Uh, the straight line there means they weren't sure about whether the 
British and Irish ice sheets that joined the Scandinavian ice sheet. Um, that, that funded, on the basis of that, Chris got the British Ice Chrono project funded. So it's Jeremy who was the modeler on it. Uh, James Scorse, who um, I was at a meeting in the mid 80s where he, he's a marine geologist, he looks at mud from the bottom of the sea, and he said that he'd found uh, sediment uh, which he thought was still on the Scilly Islands. Um, which uh, met with a degree of septic unwarranted scepticism. Then there's Colmo Coffey, who was the principal scientist on both the crews. And um, it's a photo of an annual meeting of the British. So that's uh, this. On the, so we, I've called that Team Triple Dozen. I don't see Colm on it, but I seem to remember him taking a picture uh, of all of us at one point. Um, so this is the, the work done by British. So there were two cruises uh, in successive years. Our chief scientist was Colm. We collected all kinds of data, so uh, bathymetry, scans of the uh, the seabed, uh, and sampled sediment for sediment type, and um, also for datable material. And for an example, um, Richard Chiverell and Bayesian scientists, uh, including one from Oxford archaeology department in Oxford, um, combined all these data together to produce data for the grounding line in the ice sheet. And that was, um, now um, this side is, um, well, it's basically due to Louise Callard and she, she's at Newcastle now. And she presented at the Irish Quaternary Association Annual Symposium in 2018. Um, so British came up with evidence that the LGM uh, reached the content, the, the, the ice sheet reached the continental shelf edge 29 to 27,000 kilo years before now. And then by 20,000 years, it had retreated uh, several hundred kilometers, um, allowing Tyree to resume its role as the sunniest place in Scotland. And that was even, you know, that was before the, the, the warming. And after the warming, um, much more retreat occurred. Now that there is um, this area here is the Malin Shelf, and there is some evidence of ice stream variability because of cross-cutting um, uh, landforms or landforms which are direct indicate flow direction which are cross-cutting. And the question is why do these exist? Because um, the ice sheet was undergoing a reorganisation, or are they um, some intrinsic property of ice streams? So to investigate this. Um, looked at some uh, street modeling of ice streams and the streaming is due to the temperature sensitivity of flow in this model and um, just a slightly technical point that uh, it's done with a set of equations that have been shown to uh, be able to predict uh, ice stream width reliably. Um, it's a flat bed quarter ice sheet so it's some mirror reflection around there and there and a double mirror reflection around there basal temperature is shown in red, symmetric about the diagonals. And these bigger streams here, and the, the um, periods when there are only two streams separated by five and a half thousand years. And there's also occasions when there's four streams and the smaller streams switch on and off. And then there's two types of four streams. So there's this one here, this one here and they show cross cutting they show different orientation so that may be a cause of the uh, Malin shelf evidence now there's a frequency response of ice streams is a important topic because maybe 20 years or so ago Hilmar and uh, separately Sridhar, Sridhar and Nanda Krishnan uh, showed that um, far up from the from the grounding line on ice streams you could see tidal signals in the velocity and that's, um, I call these Team Triple R because it's Rosie, Richard, Robert. Um, and uh, with the shallow ice approximation, uh, John and I showed that uh, you could relate forcing period colored, color coded here to distance that it's detectable. The forcing, the forcing at the margin is detected, detectable at the divide. 
So that's the distance from the terminus. And that this means, this shows that the faster the forcing, the nearer you have to be to the, so the, the margin to detect it. But we um, added the um, longitudinal stress term in Doug's shelfy stream. And uh, this introduces a parameter, big omega, which I've called the viscosity, but I know that Rosie next time we uh, she sees me, she'll say, no, it's it's, vis it's viscosity divided by basal resistance. And of course, she's perfectly right. So what does this do? Well, um, these, li these lines show different values of omega. And uh, they show that as Sridhar and Hilma um, detected, high frequency forcing can be detected, but detected um, much higher upstream once you put in this extra term and uh, whatever the number is has to be um, determined essentially by modeling. Now I'm going to come back to the theme of adoption and um, think basically about the time I went over to Norway to meet to go to the uh, meeting in Otta. I came across this book and it's uh, I don't have to worry about whether this word is pronounced Cecil or Cecil uh, because Cecil is a Norwegian glacier and he, um, Ruby Small and her parents go over to Norway for a holiday and Cecil um, adopts himself onto them and creaks and groans his way through uh, airport security. Ruby has got these three identical dolls whom she all calls Jennifer. So that's Team Triple J. And then um, I'm sort of aware that Katrina is... Uh, Maxim that um, they have to be clean and clearly defined and distinct roles. But um, I was relieved to find that one of the Jennifers uh, fell into a puddle in the rainstorm and had to be rescued by Cecile. Um, go back to, um, well, these are about half the people I've worked with. And there's um, all kinds of diversity in this group. So there's mathematicians, Andrew, Felix, Rob, uh, Katrine, Olga, Doug, Rosie. Um, there's soft rockers, Paul and uh, Paul and Chris, um, James. I'll call Mike a soft rocker for now. Um, Jane uh, and the Durham Daves, Evans and Roberts. Then there's people who say, "Well, ice is nice as well." So that's Dorothy, Gwendo, Howard, uh, Kenny. Um, Charlie and Nance. And also in, in this group, there's 14 different languages apart from English spoken. And I know that uh, Colm and Andrew and Paul deny that they can speak Gaelic, but uh, they know more words than me. In fact, the, the, well, it's either four or six words that I know. And so Fadche is uh, well, welcome, Slanche is uh, cheers or your health, Crack is a good time, Garda is a policeman. And then Drummond and Eskers have got Gaelic word, Gaelic origins. And then I come back to this um, team of people working together. So there's soft rockers, uh, Chris Matteo and Chris, mathematicians, uh, Andrew and Heike. And then there's languages as well. So Heike speaks Dutch, and Matteo speaks Spanish. Now, I mentioned earlier that uh, I was into uh, well, basically into jazz, saxophone music. And so I was, when I was in Durham, I was delighted to hear that Dexter Gordon, a famous American musician, was coming to visit with his band who are also all Americans. So I went up to this place in Newcastle, it's about 15 miles north of Durham, and uh, heard a, some music playing and then some people having a conversation um, just by them. So Gordon isn't here, is he sick? And I was very worried about this. No, he's left the band. Why? Oh, he's gone down to London to form a rock and roll band. So I was reasonably sure this wasn't Dexter Gordon. Um, to form a rock and roll band. Aye, and he's changed his name. What to? Sting. He, um, I'd missed by a few weeks uh, watching Sting in playing in front of uh, several dozen jazz sophisticates uh, rather than 10,000 uh, people in the mosh pit. Of course, Dexter did play that night. Um, and of course, with this mention of Gordon's, 
I am very happy to mention the late Gordon Hamilton, who died with his uh, um, skidoo uh, in 2016. He took it, he went down a crevasse um, um, near McMurdo, and that called them Team Triple G. So this is my last slide. Um, got to thank you all for all that we've done. And it's not only me, but many, many others. And I'll come back to the theme of uh, Prilaguri that uh, comes up with the th glaciological themes. It's work in the open air. It's work about patterns and it's about communication. There's also, it's also a warning. And that's because um, it's a theme that's common to young Scandinavians. Um, Gre Greta has, um, come up with is well concerned about what global warming will do to the south of Manhattan. Well, this is a, sorry, this is a south of Manhattan Island. That's from rising sea level and also from uh, increased storminess. And um, the, these, this is basically due to the carbon dioxide in the air. And she's got something in common, well, not only nationality, but also ideas about uh, carbon dioxide with uh, Arrhenius. And uh, it's actually a few months ago it emerged that Arrhenius' mother, uh, before she got married, had the same family name as Greta. So um, now it comes Greta's warning, is very much younger than me, uh, is that she believes that action must be taken as a climate emergency. And um, she's become very insistent in the last few months that it's deeds, not words, that are important. And I fully agree with that. And I extend the thanks once more. And now I'll stop talking. Thank you very much indeed. Um, do we have questions for um, Richard and Doug? Oh, I, sh I should show you the final slide, which is um, next week, Fujita-san uh, will tell us about um, behind the, the glacier fields. Thank you, Richard. Yes, it'd be great to see everyone next week. But are there any questions for... Um... I'll, I'll flip back to Greta's slide. Have you gone Swedish, uh, Richard? I got Swedish. We can't. Um, well, my my mother's father was a vicar in the north of Sweden. <laughs> that explains a few things. Yes, yes. So I uh, I did notice that the crystal was made in Sweden, and uh, I'm very happy about that. Well, there are many, many congratulations to both of you uh, on the chat. And uh, I know some people have had to had to leave um, in order to, in, I suspect, in the US get to other work commitments. But um, they were really, really wonderful talks. Paco, do you want to say um, anything to finish up? For, oh, we've got... In fact, I had a question, a brief one for, uh, for Doug uh, related to uh, Gerald Seligman, what, do you think the IGS would have been uh, possible uh, without James Worthy? Um, I, I don't think so, because um, yes, I think that James Wardy was absolutely essential for the IGS because he was acting as the president of the Royal Geographical Society. And the idea was that you could create the IGS, the journal, um, in a way that had legitimacy. And if you have a industrialist, amateur scientist creating something which is completely disconnected from any other academic organization, then the IGS would have li likely failed. 
But Seligman was a genius in organization, and he knew that he had to bring in very uh, respected scientists uh, from elsewhere to make the initial IGS legitimate. So Wardy, I think, was, was uh, essential, but he was not active. Seligman did all the work. Wardy only provided the status for those early years of the first the British and then the international. And British was just tactical. It was just to you know, convince the Royal Society, Geographic Society to make funding. Okay, then I'm really happy that both together, uh, Gerald Schrickman and James Wardy, uh, created this uh, and succeeded in uh, pushing forward this uh, IGS, which has uh, also um, embraced such a great scientist as these two people, uh, Richard Heimers and Don McHale, that we have been honoring today. Uh, through the Selim and Crystal. So thanks to both of you for your contribution to science and to the IES in particular. Thanks. Okay. That's okay. all from my side. <laughs> <laughs> A huge thank you to both of you for really fantastic talks and just really nice to see lots of different connections made, as everyone said on the chat. Um, so I think we don't have any more questions probably for you. Um, so just to say thank you very, very much indeed and hope to see everyone at, at next week's seminar. That would be fantastic. So thank you very much indeed. Thanks everyone for listening.